Britain's multicultural bargain created the space for radical Islamism, but not the means to reach it, writes Kenan Malik in his work From Fatwa to Jihad. For Kenan Malik, today's liberal obsession with multiculturalism, group rights and recognition, identity and offence, has nourished the soil from which radical Islamism has sprouted throughout the Western world. Instead of jihadism being a purely religious phenomena, it is instead an inextricably political phenomena, the result of disaffected youth being caught in a chasm, alien to both their group-oriented advocacy groups and mainstream society. Instead of multiculturalism creating a society that is capable of catering to all, it has ostracised swathes, and some of these swathes have given in to the allure of violent extremism. According to Malik, issues of group allegiance, identity politics and Islamic incompatibility came to the fore of British consciousness with the Rushdie affair. Salman Rushdie's work, The Satanic Verses, published in 1988 by Penguin, caused international outrage among various Islamic communities, spurned public book burnings in Bradford, protests in Pakistan and a fatwa sanctioning the murder of its author from Ayatollah Khomeini of Iran. The book was deemed defamation. However, the outrage was less kindled by religious sensitivity than political posturing. Muslims weren't caught in a fog of rage after reading the book, but instead protesting at a time that self-appointed community leaders thought it expedient to do so. As Sher Adzam, chairman of the Bradford Council of Mosques and an organiser of the 1989 protests in Bradford stated, Salman Rushdie has been good for us Muslims. We used to have questions about who we are and where we are going. Now we know. We've found ourselves as Muslims. And so for Malik, similar threads weave. Protests in Pakistan were organised by Jamaat e Islami to derail a recently lost election and mobilise supporters. The fatwa issued by Khomeini occurred at a time of increasing competition between Saudi Arabia and Iran. To it, the issue became one through which groups could assert themselves as authentic voices of a community, and thus reap the political dividend. So what dividend? Malik discusses a political and personal evolution in Britain through which individuals gradually stopped finding commonality through political activism and instead through identity. First generation migrants arriving in Britain throughout the 50s and 60s, mostly from India and Pakistan, kept their faith a private matter, were mostly politically apathetic, and kept strong ties to their native culture and roots through a strong social network or biradari system, reminiscent of their home country. Then the rampant racism afflicting many throughout the 60s and 70s, largely affecting second generation migrants, served to metamorphose the next generation into a more radical and politically active bloc. Indeed, Malik points out that throughout this period, a radical Muslim was a term used to denote the revolutionary, anti-racist, left-wing, vociferously secularist ideology many adopted in combating the increasingly political violence of the National Front about the time. Groups like the Asian Youth Movement, which drew inspiration from both class-based Marxist politics and the American Black Power Movement, severed ties with the more politically detached attitude of their parents' generation. Asians began to separate into an apparently distinct political bloc, as a safety in numbers approach became a necessary strategy in order to protect against the violent racism of the moment. Gradually this ghetto politics became naturalised. Not only did sticking together become a political strategy, but also a necessity, as groups came to see themselves as culturally distinct. This was the birth of postmodern identity politics. About this time government policy changed at the local level. Councils aiming to cater for the diversity of their constituents sought self-appointed community leaders to advise on local policy decisions which strongly incentivized groups to act as, and conceive of themselves as, groups to gain financial dividend. This proved ideal for religious leaders who supposedly spoke for the entirety of the Muslims in their respective areas. Sher Adzam of the Bradford Council of Mosques remarked, what we wanted from the council was their support for our efforts to make sure that our children were not lost to our culture or Islam. We told the council that the best way to help us was to restore pride in our culture and our religion. The result of this was the creation of different cultural blocks competing with each other for council resources. Individuals thus began to conceive of themselves as members of distinct communities, 
which were given group rights according to their supposed distinctness. This, says Malik, is the essence of multiculturalism. That's and the politics of feeling. Religious revivalist culture of the late 20th century is marked by an anti-intellectualism and increased emotional involvement. This has risen in tandem with a culture that praises victimhood and cultivated vulnerability. Moreover, Malik writes that this revivalism is often individualistic. Emphasis is placed on someone's personal emotional reaction to something. And thus, an assault on a religion, for example, becomes an assault on someone's personhood as a believer. This puts into context hyperbolic quotes of individuals giving their response to these satanic verses, including some likening reading the book to being raped. It also draws a likeness between the visceral emotional responses Muslims felt when witnessing video footage of Serbian atrocities, and those that Christians in America felt when witnessing video footage of abortions. This valorizes offence, and offence itself becomes political currency and a tool through which groups can mobilise. The Satanic Verses is an illustrative case in point, as was the Danish cartoon controversy. Offence became a pertinent emotion, mobilised politically to secure the interests of so-called community leaders to increase the influence of the groups they supposedly represent. The Islamist terrorist is the one that has slipped through the cracks. Someone that finds no representation in the often elderly and traditionalist self-appointed community leaders reaping the multicultural dividend, and a mainstream Western culture that they feel no stake in. This is what Malik means when he says Britain's multicultural bargain created the space for radical Islamism but not the means to reach it. Multiculturalism segmented society into discrete demographic blocks, thought separate and wholly disparate from one another. However, the apparatus through which to communicate with these blocks necessarily alienate significant swathes within each block, as so-called community leaders are unable to speak for the huge heterogeneity within. In effect, multiculturalism alienates the minorities within the minorities, or simply the least vocal. The feeling of alienation, being caught in a chasm, creates the space the terrorist comes to occupy. The problem with this analysis is it leaves little room for doctrinal justification. Hindus, Sikhs, ethnic minority groups and others have been set apart in similar ways through multiculturalism, and yet jihadi terrorism is by far the most common form in Western nations. In Malik's 2017 afterward, he cites Dylan Roof's murder of nine African Americans, the murder of Joe Cox, Xavier Johnson's murder of police officers as evidence of the same process in other communities. The question is, why are there more jihadis than Dylan Roof's, Thomas Mayer's and Xavier Johnson's? Perhaps you could argue that Muslims have been disproportionately affected by these policy measures, or that Muslims are treated as nothing but Muslims more often than Hindus are treated as nothing but Hindu, or whites as nothing but white, or blacks as nothing but black, but how can this be quantified or assessed? It is also true that simply picking passages from the Quran and deftly laying blame on a text is problematic and deeply insufficient. Kenan writes that his interest is not in what the Quran says, but in what Muslims say the Quran says. This is of course a sensible approach, but opining possible interpretations to be infinite is equally problematic. A passage that reads, slay the unbeliever wherever you find them, is more easily read as kill the infidel than let's cuddle kittens. Conversely, one would be hard pressed to interpret cuddle the kittens as a call to arms. It seems a really obvious point to raise, but it's rarely given credence. Moreover, ignoring any analysis of types of Islam from the equation obfuscates what jihadis often say in their own words. Of course, this raises a question. Should we simply acknowledge the stated motives of the jihadis, assume the case is closed, and move on with our analysis? Well, obviously not. People don't always say what they mean or mean what they say, be it intentionally or unintentionally. That said, that two in three Muslims would not give police terror tip-offs certainly suggests there is something in contemporary strands of British Islam that are at least complicit with jihadism, if not actively supportive of it. Prohibitions against spying and gossip are a normative facet of many Muslims' belief. Could this be a reason? Is it even right to entertain it as such if invoking religion? Maybe this is due to victimhood and separation from British institutions. Is victimhood or separateness detached from the expressions of some forms of Islamic religiosity? Or is it an integral part of it? These are questions that Malik never asks. Malik correctly points out that many groups, notably the Muslim Council of Britain among others, 
are Islamist and also aligned closely with government and media, gaining unwarranted visibility and projecting their image of Islam to the masses. Is this ideology not at least partly relevant to the discussion? Not necessarily in a deterministic sense. Islamic thought in Britain hasn't necessarily led to violence, but due to certain conditions, certain interpretations have gathered weight in some communities, and these interpretations should be understood and challenged. Malik is thus right to single out state-sanctioned multiculturalism as a contributing factor that has certainly shaped the way groups think of themselves and the way groups are able to mobilise politically. However, it says nothing of how certain narratives have gained credence over others. Why, for example, have some disaffected youths turned to jihadism as opposed to any other sensibility, religious or otherwise? Why have they chosen to commit such violent acts in the name of Islam for legitimacy? Malik's analysis has absolutely nothing to say on these issues, nor can it. Ultimately, it seems that Malik's gripe is with identity. Not identity in general, but cultural or ethnic identity taking priority over other forms of political identity. Political identity ferments discussion, debate and societal progress, whereas cultural, racial or religious identities generate offence, competition, alienation and animosity. They are a hindrance to societal progress and free speech. According to Malik, we have internalised the fatwa. We now police ourselves in fear of giving offence or in fear of violence. Despite the violence and uproar, the satanic verses continued to be published back in the day. That would likely not be the case were something similar to happen. This makes sense given Malik's political background. A former member of the Revolutionary Communist Party, it does make sense that Malik would conceive of said identities as a form of false consciousness an obstacle implemented by the establishment to prevent true political change. Malik believes the policies of multiculturalism ultimately were put into place to castrate increasingly boisterous groups like the Asian Youth Movement. Instead of rabble-rousing for economic equality on the streets of Bradford, Bolton and London, the government thought it better to confine them to the mosque under the watchful gaze of the pious Imam. This strategy came to bite the government on the backside decades later. Conversely, minority groups have agitated for the censorship of materials they deemed offensive and avidly supported legislation designed to curtail free speech. Now segments of these same minority populations are having their speech curtailed under the same legislation. The answer then is to stop treating groups as groups and instead treat their constituent members as individuals. A return to enlightenment universalism with the unfettered freedom of speech that should come with it. The problem is that damage has been done, and without a cogent understanding and challenging of the ideology's constituent of violent extremism, such unfettered free speech could only exacerbate the problem. This may necessarily require singling out Islam, or certain trends therein, which is something Malik would rather do away with entirely. Moreover, could things have happened any differently? Instead of multiculturalism being a coordinated plan, Perhaps it was haplessly bumbled into as groups proved impermeable due to the sheer numbers in which they arrived. It hardly seems reasonable to expect tens of thousands, now hundreds of thousands, to assimilate at the drop of a hat each and every year. However, Malik would never criticise immigration. Indeed, he says that he criticises multiculturalism without talking about the faults that immigration may entail. Could we have had mass immigration without multiculturalism? What would that have even looked like? Malik's analysis identifies one of the possible problems, but not what a possible alternative may have been. Perhaps there never was one. Thanks a lot for watching this video. If you liked the video, don't forget to like and subscribe. If you didn't, click dislike, leave a comment and tell me why. As always, huge thank you to my patrons. It's thanks to you guys that I'm able to keep these videos regular. If you like my content and it's within your means to do so, then hey, maybe consider becoming a patron yourself. Thanks a lot again and until next time.